Okay, everybody, welcome to homeschooling in Alberta for the coming year of 2020, 2021. Nice that you could join us and hopefully this will be informative, answer your questions. I started homeschooling 20 years ago and it's like having your first child. The first year is this huge learning curve and after that you're a pro, you're an old hand, you can start giving advice to everybody else. But it, it is a bit confusing the first time, but believe me, it, it gets so much better after a while, okay? And you know what? You have to trust in yourself. You're a veteran home educator already. You have been teaching your child since birth. Absolutely. Um, when your baby loves a toy, you get the toy for them. When your toddler wants a book read, you read a book. When your preschooler wants to sign up for a gymnastic class, you sign up for gymnastics. You are already a home educator and I bet you didn't know it. When a preschooler asks, oh, why is the sky always blue? You're willing to answer their questions and that's all you need to do. Absolutely. Most parents have enough knowledge to teach their kids to about grade eight level without even teacher's manuals. And after that, the kids are online. They can teach themselves, really, they do. Uh, my math ends at grade eight, and I never thought I would homeschool my kids all through high school, but they loved it. They wanted to keep going. So we did, and they just, you know, I did grade eight, maybe a bit of grade nine, but after that, they, I had to find them some tutors and teachers, and, and you can do that. So this is kind of, I'm just going to turn my video off, and I'm just here to say hello, and you can see me, and and then I'll come back on in the end. But so this is the education continuum. Now, most 95% of parents in Alberta send their kids to a school. And um, except for this year. <laughs> so this year, uh, it moved a bit along the continuum here to distance education where the school um, still set up shop, but in your living room. And the difference there is that the school controls everything. So it's not so much where education takes place, it's who controls it. So for the most part, parents have been teaching their kids, facilitating assignments, um, nagging them to do stuff, but it's been um, directed by the school. Now, you can change that legally and take back your child's education by registering for home education. And that's where parent controls everything. So if your child doesn't want to do an assignment, yeah, drop it, right? You don't have to force them to do it and turn something in. And then once parents start learning how much their children learn and pick up on their own, a lot of them go to more self-directed education or what we call unschooling, where the child follows their curiosity and meanders through different topics that are not set out in time and sequence and school, but they actually end up learning. And I really think the future of education is kind of a hybrid model where we can encompass all of these. It doesn't have to be all or nothing, all school or all home education or all distance education. It can be a lot of things. So right now, if you decide you can continue with school controlling education in your living room, those are what we call distance education programs. They're called teacher directed, uh, blended, online, or the school part of a shared responsibility. Now, if you don't want to do that, if you want to control it, you can go on home education. And it's sometimes called traditional, but the term Alberta education uses is home education. And that is totally your baby. You control everything. And it doesn't mean you have to teach. It means you're taking responsibility for your children's education, and then you can outsource it. You can hire tutors, um, babies, or uh, teaching co-ops with other parents. You can get together and have other parents teach your child. You can hire your childcare professionals. 
You can let your student lead the way in unschooling, or you can pick a whole whack of courses from other countries and other schools to teach your child outside of our government school system. How do children prove their learning? Everybody writes a diploma exams in Alberta for, for marks and credits in grade 12 if they want those things. And most kids, it's whether they learn science through an online course or through a, a US course or through a Alberta approved textbook. Science is science. They're going to learn science and they can absolutely have enough knowledge to write those exams at the end. Um, another thing too, if your child's on parent-controlled home education, your child can absolutely get a high school diploma. I know there's rumors out there saying they can't. That is not true. So this is me. I'm Judy Arnell. I um, am an education consultant and I have been homeschooling my kids for the last 20 years. And um, I have been certified in the growing brain from zero to three and the brain story. So my whole life's work is about child development and how children reach different stages of development. And my recent interest is how does that apply to learning? So I really like that. We have a happy homeschooling handbook if you're interested. And my newest book out there is called Unschooling to University. So it talks about my children's journey from going from self-directed play to post-secondary university and what their friends did too. 30 of their friends did the same thing and how um, they turned out. We think teachers are amazing. I think teachers are doing the best they can with, with what they have to work with, but um, the system doesn't always work for our children. When my oldest two boys were in grade two and three, they would go to school all day and do the work, little worksheets here, and then they come home and want to learn what they really wanted to learn. So my oldest, he wanted to plant an egg and see if it would grow an egg tree. And he nagged me and nagged me and I said, well, okay, let's do it. And, and more and more we did after schooling, which is where kids come home and learn what they want to learn, not what they have to learn in school. And so being new first time homeschoolers, I thought, okay, we have to set up our home like a school. We have to have recess. We have to have, um, we got to start at nine o'clock and finish at three o'clock. <laughs> we have to do workbooks and textbooks. And of course, that doesn't last very long. As you can see by my son who wrote on his math book, I hate mathematics. <laughs> And since then, I've learned young children just don't learn that way. Just because a school teaches that way, because they have to teach 30 kids efficiently, doesn't mean you have to teach that way. You can educate your children happily through board games, through watching videos, through YouTube, through going on field trips to the Science Center and Zoo, all the fun stuff you get to do because you're not teaching a classroom of 30 kids. And believe me, it won't take you six hours a day to do it. And we'll talk about that later. So once we became homeschoolers, we actually didn't get around much to homeschooling. We went out a lot and went to playgroups and parks and picnics and fun stuff. And eventually my children gained their love of mathematics. In fact, my engineer is the one who wrote this on his grade two workbook. So we played for 10 years and the kids kept on learning. They wrote the provincial achievement test because I asked them to, and they did within the acceptable region and also the excellent region. And there's their first full day of school, grade 10, grade 11, grade 12. Most of them went for only two weeks to one year and they decided it was taking too much of their time and they came home to finish self-directed high school. They wrote 21 diploma exams, got an average of 78%, and the provincial average is 65%. So doing pretty good. They got scholarships. And the interesting part was when most kids are burning out from school, they've done three years preschool, elementary school, junior high school. By high school, they're done. They are burning out. And those are the years that count. So 
a lot of homeschool kids are actually gearing up for those years because they haven't had all that time to um, to do that. Absolutely. Okay, can everyone else hear me or is it frozen? Anybody? How are we doing with the storm? Okay, great, awesome. Okay, so really children do not need earlier, longer and more academics in their lives. They do not need 16 years of school. All they need is basically probably high school or grade 12 and they need more play. So kids who are used to owning their time do not need adults to entertain them. And that's kind of a scare for a lot of would-be homeschoolers is, you know, this time comes summer, all the media says, oh, how are you going to entertain your kids all summer? Well, the secret with homeschoolers is we don't entertain our kids. They find their own fun and they clean up. And here's my gang today. So three have graduated university. Um, one is still in university and one is finishing up his self-directed high school and one's off to grad school this fall for a master's program. So, and not bad for someone whose math doesn't go past grade eight. <laughs> okay, so um, where are we? Okay, let's move on. So let's, when we talk tonight, let's assume that we want to leave all doors open. Um, if you want your children to go on to university, fine, or to go on to colleges or art school or entrepreneurship, those are all wonderful, successful careers, and they can do that, okay? So here's the choices in education. Um, I'm just going to move my little taskbar here because it's in the way. Yay. Okay. So here's the choices. So 95% of the children in this province are in this upper square. They go to public or Catholic schools governed by the Education Act and run by trustees that are publicly elected. They follow the Alberta programs of study outcomes, which come to about 1400 outcomes per grade. They can also do it through classroom or as in distance education right now through print or online. And children, each student is fully funded at about $11,000 per child. Absolutely. In my group of five kids, we've saved taxpayers half a million dollars, just our family, in funding by homeschooling. Okay. And yes, your local resident public school board has to take all the kids in that catchment area, whether you home educate or you send them to school. They have to take everybody. Now we have a section called charter schools, and that's probably about 1% of the school aged children governed by the Education Act, where schools answer direct to the minister. They don't have trustees or board of directors. They have to follow the Alberta programs of study, and they can also do classroom attendance, print-based, or online, which is distance ed. They get full funding too. Then in this corner, there are the independent schools. About 4% of children go to independent schools, and they come from all walks of life. They are not the 1%. They come from all different salary grades. And it's because independent schools offer choice and they offer programs that are more unique to students than the public system can offer. They also follow the Education Act. They're run by a board of directors. They follow the Alberta programs of study. They can do classroom print or online too, but they only get 60 to 70 percent funding and pretty well no infrastructure funding for buildings or buses, which means they have to charge tuition fees. To parents to offset the costs. And then in that corner down here, so if you're doing distance education, such as teacher directed, print based, online, blend ed, you are going to choose one of these three options and the school controls your child's education. Now, if you decide you're going to take responsibility for your child's education, you can sign up here. 
This is about two to 3% of the children in the province. It is governed by the home education regulations within the Education Act. You have a choice. You can follow the Alberta programs of study, the 1400 outcomes per grade, or you can follow the schedule of learning outcomes for home educators, which is only 22 outcomes by the time your child turns 20. Yes, that's it. 22 outcomes. That's it. <laughs> so that is very flexible, very open. Now, once you register part of your home education program in a classroom, a print, teacher directed or online, that becomes a shared responsibility program where you're giving authority to the school to teach your child part of their subjects. You still retain part of your control for certain subjects on home education. Funding for the school for total home education is $1,700 and they have to share half of that to the parent. Okay, I hope that's clear as mud. <laughs> so all these three squares are school, and this square is parent controlled, except when you farm out some of it back to the school, then it becomes shared. That's important. And it's dependent when you register your child, you know, coming up now or next month, be very clear what program you're registering from because that's how the school boards get funded based on the codes they enter into your child's PASI profile of who is doing what. If your child is coded 600, you have total control. If your child is coded 620 online, you have zero control. Same with 621. All right. Um, a lot of these slides I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go through because they're not really relevant. So in Alberta, our education system is based on outcomes. There's, you can use any resources you want to meet outcomes. So for example, this is a grade one science topic called creating color. So you can meet that outcome by giving your child a pack of crayons and paper and say, have at it. <laughs> or you could also meet that outcome by showing them a magic school bus video on colors. So either way, or you could give them a color wheel and say, here, play with us. You could meet all these outcomes however way you want. Alberta education no longer dictates resources that has to be used and that's mostly grades one to nine and for high school it's a bit more strict in that um, your child does have to meet certain outcomes for the courses if they want marks and credits so children learn in many ways school here is only one way that they learn and like I said in home education you have the flexibility to Help your child learn in all these ways. It doesn't have to be through workbooks and textbooks. Children around age 13 are more willing to sit down and do book work and seat work, but until then, they're going to be distracted. They're going to sit there and go, oh, I don't want to do this. And it's going to take them three hours to do one math worksheet. Oh, so find another way, another day. Absolutely. Okay, so I think I have clarified this. Um, school is government controlled. It can be a physical class, online, blended, correspondence, distributed learning, teacher directed, or distance education. Home education is a parent and the student controls. Okay, um, why do people homeschool? Number one is probably academic delays or academics are not up to snuff. That's what we're hearing a lot from parents. They're discovering that their child's in grade five and doesn't know anything. Um, <laughs> bullying is number two. And 
special needs not being met. And we have a lot of families who just want to travel in world school. And that's becoming um, more and more a popular way, reason to homeschool. So this is kind of the history. I'm not going to go through this. You don't need to know this, really. Um, <laughs> let's move on. Whoops, am I stuck? Okay, what do you have to do first? Oh, actually, if you have naysayers in your family, the Fraser Institute has some really good research on home education. Um, their 200, 2007 report was more based in the US. The 2015 report was more based in Canada. And they have found that homeschoolers attend at least eight social activities a week, which kind of blows that, oh, they're not socialized thing out the window. They're academically better than the best private schools. It's growing and there's no socioeconomic status bias. So no matter what your postal code is, you can do an awesome job educating your child. Now, Alberta has three rules. This may change by September 1st with the passage of Bill 15. If Bill 15 passes, you do not have to do number three. If it passes with our wish list, you might not even have to do number two. What they want you to do is number one, submit a notification form. Now, we have to wait and see what the government's doing with that, but until that passes, you still submit to three rules according to the home education regulations. So number one is you have to submit a notification form to a supervising school authority somewhere in Alberta. Doesn't have to be your resident board. You can be in Lethbridge and submit it to Peace River if you would like to, to um, register with them. And it's a notification form. It is not a, oh, can I have permission to register? The difference is um, most of the supervising schools are what is called school of choice. They do not have to take your child if you're out of their catchment just area. If, they, if your child is in the catchment area, such as Edmonton Public or Calgary Board of Education, yes, they do have to accept your child under home education because they're publicly funded and um, they, they are there for your child. <laughs> okay, number two, must file a learning plan or an education plan. And number three is you have to have a facilitator from your school authority come visit your child twice per year, once in the fall, once in the spring. So how do you start? Step one, um, you notify your school. So if you're gonna pick a new school board, you send in your notification form, they will let your old school know that they need your child's accumulative file. So the, the last school will send it to the, the current school and that they won't be coming back. You don't even have to notify your old school. If you're looking at this and it's mid-year, let's say it's October, you want to homeschool now, you're stuck with the school your child registered with on September 30th. But you can still send in a notification form saying, I'm switching, you're no longer authorized to provide my child's education. I'm taking back the responsibility. I know I have to supervise with you, but I am educating my child now. And you stay with them for the rest of the year because they got your child's funding and they own your child. Okay, here's what a notification form looks like. Um, it's pretty basic. We have a, um, video at Alberta Edu homeschooling, <laughs> so Alberta homeschooling.ca on how to fill this out. Okay, so it's a four page form. And like I said, it does not ask for permission. It says this is what I'm doing. So step two is you have to pick a school board. And I know that's very hard for a lot of people right now. They don't know who to pick. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, you have to have your child registered somewhere by September 30th, unless, of course, Bill 15 passes before them. 
save all your receipts now because October 1st, once funding's assured, you can start getting reimbursements back. So how it works is you buy things, you can buy board games and books and things now, keep your receipts and then submit them in October and you'll get half back in November and half back next May. Let's say you decide by Christmas, yeah, this home education thing is not working out for me. I want to put my child back in the system. Absolutely. You don't have to worry. They're not going to test your child or want to see your child's work. They will just accept your child back and they go into the grade that they were meant to go in according to their age. Please be aware there's no funding for homeschool kindergarten because kindergarten, even in schools, is voluntary. Um, it's not mandatory. So it's a nice to have, but not needs to have. Okay, these are a lot. These are not all of them. <laughs> these were a lot of the home education supervision boards that you can sign up with. The large boards, as you can see, are public funded boards. The smaller boards are tend to be more independent schools. The ones that are highlighted in yellow will supervise home education high school for a diploma, so for credits and marks. The ones in white um, choose not to. So how do you pick? How do you pick what you want to? Look at what their programs are. If you feel this is not the year you're confident to take on the responsibility, maybe you do want to do more online. Um, or teacher directed. That's okay. You can hand that over to the school authority. Um, maybe you want to pick a board that has shared responsibility just to get your feet wet for a bit and then you can switch to home education later when you feel a bit more confident. Hopefully that school authority will support your confidence because they should. They are not there to undermine your confidence as some do. <laughs> um, look at their funding rules. Everybody, there's basic rules from the government, but some school boards have more rules over and above the government just because sometimes government authorities claw back differently. It depends on the person or how interpretation of the rules go. Look at the number of activities they run, although that may be a non-issue this fall in terms of COVID, but um, generally the big public boards tend to run more activities because they have economies of scale. Um, whereas the smaller independent school programs tend to run some programming, like if they're in Peace River, they'll come down to Lethbridge and put on a day of programming once or twice a year. Um, but the benefit is that the smaller independent ones have homeschooled their own children, their facilitators get it, they understand your unique needs with home education. A lot of the large public boards just hire teachers, a lot are not even parents, a lot do not understand home education. So ask if they have staff professional development in home education. Um, and if they say no, ask why not? <laughs> Talk to people who grumble as well as people who rave about the boards because they're out there too. <laughs> you know, and high school, ask to compare course requirements. Um, what do you want my child to do for English 30-1? And see what comes up because there's some variation out there. I know one board wants children to do four essays, another board wants children to do two essays. So that makes a big difference in terms of kids that are juggling high school course requirements. Next, what is your philosophy of education? Um, as much as possible, the younger your child is, the more they should be doing the bottom part of the triangle because it sticks more than just paperwork at the top part. Um, this is very interesting. This shows the development of your child's self-control. And you can see from birth to age three, there's very little. And then there's this big leap from age three to age six. And this is why children don't start formal studies until age six, until they have a level of self-control to sit and listen for 20 minutes. 
And then it kind of plateaus a bit until age 13. And then from 13 to 25 goes that final plateau. And that's where you'll, you'll find, especially around 17 here, when kids really buckle down and want to do book work. So if your child pushes back on work until they're 17, that's fine. By 17, they have a lot of years to pick up high school and do more formal studies. So there's lots of philosophies. Not one is better than the other. It depends on you, what you want to do. When I say APS, I mean follow the Alberta programs of study outcomes, the 1400 outcomes for grade for all subjects, or maybe really some people just worry about math and English. They figure children need to read, write, do math, all the rest of the subjects can be interest-based. And, and that is what a lot of educators follow around the world too. That is the most important is can your children learn to read? Can they write? Can they do some basic math? And then the rest is whatever they wanna learn through unit studies or projects. Um, through unschooling or through traveling. Okay, unschooling is the methodology of homeschooling. So you can list your resources on your education plan. You can list some of your activities if you know what they're going to be. A lot of them you're not going to because when unschooling, you never know what what's going to the day is going to bring. Um, and then you list how you assess. For most of we were unschoolers for most of what my children learned. I put down observation because you're there 24 hours, seven days a week. You know exactly what your children know. You absolutely do. <laughs> so you don't need to tell um, an employee of the government what your child's doing so they can come back and advise you what your child's doing. <laughs> it's so preposterous. So anyways, um, so a lot of children unschool, they just play from ages 6 to 17. They take the grade 12 courses because the diploma exams are only on the grade 12 courses. They're not on anything before that. They write those, they study the key, get the basic points of those exams, and off they go to college and university. So where most kids um, play until about age 6, they keep on playing, they don't go to school. <laughs> and then they kind of just sneak in there at the end, home base. <laughs> okay, um, step four is choose one of three programs. So like I said, parent home education, parent directed, 100% parent controlled. You choose resources, and of course you can outsource anything you want, we talked about that. You can follow the Alberta programs of study or the schedule of learning outcomes for home educators. So this one's 1400 outcomes per grade. This is 22 outcomes. You can choose whatever method, including unschooling. You can choose your assessment, including not doing assessment. You do not have to submit your child for exams of any kind. The only exam home educated children have to take if they want credits is high school, grade 12 diplomas. You get funding and you follow the home education regulations. On school controlled, it's called all these different things, teacher directed, paper-based resource, online, correspondence, or blend ed. The school chooses the resources, because they have to follow the Alberta programs of study. They choose the methods and they deliver to the student. Any school that says you as a parent have to teach is violating the regulations. You are not allowed to teach school programs. You have to be a certified teacher to teach. That's according to the Education Act and the Funding Manual and the Guide to Education. The school chooses assessment, including exams and marks. There is no funding or resources for parent because you're not teaching. <laughs> the relationship is between the student and the teacher. There is not a relationship between the parent and the teacher. There are report cards 
and their parent-teacher interviews, and it follows the Education Act. And then you can have half and half, which is half parent-controlled, well, it used to be half. Now it's actually 20% or 80%, either way. So you can control 20% and the school control 80%. If the parent controls less than 20%, um, they, um, they, then it becomes 100% school directed. Okay, so shared responsibility. Again, um, if the school does more than 80%, then it's deemed a 100% online school directed program and it will be funded at 100% and it's expected to follow the regulations for 100% school directed. Um, not all schools have to sh offer shared responsibility, they really don't. And it's up to them if they want to, as well as um, what percentage they want to offer. So um, that will be determined when we decide to, uh, or when you decide to pick a school authority. So <clears throat> right now with the new funding manual, parents get a percentage of the funding um, based on what percent they're actually going to teach. And the school can now dip into the parents' portion of funding to offset the costs of them providing teaching on their part. And it follows part the Education Act on the school responsible parts and part home education regulations on the parent responsible part. Schools tend to divide shared by subject. So they may, math and English take the most percentage of school time in elementary. So that's about 50%, just those two subjects. The rest like health, science, social studies, um, art, music, take the other 50%. So it's really easy to divide up percentages. In high school, 20% is about seven credits. So it's about a course and a little bit. So if parents are teaching one course in high school, that would be meet that part of the shared responsibility or schools are. But remember, your child could get an Alberta education diploma on all those programs, whether it's home education, whether it's school, or whether it's shared responsibility. Now, when I was talking about the solo outcomes, those 22 outcomes your child has to meet by the time they're age 20, these are them. And you can see they're super, super flexible. So for example, English is read for information, understanding and enjoyment, write and speak clearly, accurately and appropriately for the contacts. So it doesn't say that they have to study Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet in grade nine. Um, it's very, very, very flexible. You write down your resources here. So if you want to buy anything, it has to be on your education plan. So, and this is a work in progress. You can file a new plan anytime you want. Just email it in to your school authority. But say Christmas comes and you want to buy some Lego, you put it here under math, somewhere here, there. Put your Lego there and you file the new plan. And oftentimes what I did was I just did the same plan year after year and just modified it a bit for what my child was interested in or was now capable of reading. So these are the 22 outcomes. They're very super flexible. Okay, um, how long does home education take? <laughs> now, many people, some parents have been doing five to six hours of schoolwork a day when teachers send home work, and that is overkill. Most home educators do not do that amount of time. Elementary takes about 10 to 30 minutes of seat work and then reading and field trips are on top. Junior high should take about an hour a day and grades 10 to 12 should take two to three hours per day. Um, no homework. So if your child's doing more than that, they're in a distance education program that is giving them so much more work, so much more work and you might want to shop around. And that's a good question to ask schools is, how long will my child be doing work during a typical day 
on your distance education program or your teacher directed program. Because if you do home education, you can get done a curriculum in these times. Um, because you know what your child likes and you can do a lot of the learning through experiential learning like field trips. Many homeschoolers never finish a year, we get distracted. <laughs> you know, May comes, so we don't usually start until October because September is very nice. And you'll find that too, a lot of um, September, you won't be hearing from your school board that second day of school. We are much more relaxed in home education. You will hear from your school sometime in September, but don't panic if you get there and you don't hear from them. Um, they will get to you. And many homeschoolers don't start till October, and then we take December off, and then we get going in January again, and then we definitely quit by May because the weather's getting nicer. So, and if we don't finish by May, we still quit. And then we just put the kids in the next grade the next year, and they do just fine. So I want to assure parents, you know, just taking these months off for COVID, their children keep on learning. Absolutely. What do you start with for curriculum? I would suggest a library card and the internet to start. You do not need tons and tons of curriculum. In fact, we usually have spring curriculum sales and those are all things that didn't work for our kids that we wanna pass off. <laughs> but you know, what doesn't work, kids are different. What doesn't work for our kids doesn't mean it's not gonna work for some other child. So um, start slow if you, you know, I've got a lot of questions about those curriculum workbooks at Costco. Use those. Those are awesome. I flipped through them. Grade two is, I mean, they're, they're still a bit advanced, I think, for Alberta um, outcomes, but your kid will be ahead and you can use them as an example of what to teach. But you do not have to make your child do the workbooks. It gives you an idea of how to teach something maybe in the kitchen while you're baking or maybe through a board game. So make it as fun as possible. Okay, and here I was telling you about how um, the grade ones to six subject areas, how they kind of English and math take up most of it because grades one to three is teaching your kids how to read so that they can read to learn in grades four to six, especially in a classroom where that's the main delivery method is through paper and text. But at home, you don't have to do that. Okay. Math, um, kids learn math through many ways. Math is about solving problems around them. So they learn um, very much through experiential learning, cooking, baking, playing board games, really good ideas to learn math. Um, card games are really good too. And then about age 13, that was when my kids did their first math class um, on paper. They're able their brains able that frontal lobe is able to transfer what they know um, through experiential learning onto paper and then actually figure out oh this is how i add fractions this is how i divide fractions and they can learn eight grades of math in one year in grade eight because you know what their brain is ready it's kind of like toilet training at age four it takes a day versus age two that takes months. <laughs> children are developmentally ready. Reading. Most children's brains crack the code at around age six, seven, eight. Now, everybody thinks kids go to school to learn how to read. Not true. Reading is a developmental skill that happens on each child's timetable. Again, like toilet training. It just happens to occur in school. So, we assume that kids learn to read because they're taught. They're not taught. Well, they are taught, but they get it because it clicks, okay? So um, I had some late readers, as you can see. My boys learned to read at eight, nine, and 10. And in school, they would have been sent off to remedial classes. They would have been teased. They would have been, had a big deal made about it, where at home, we never told the kids what grade they were in. We just compared them to their previous progress. We didn't compare them to siblings or anybody else. And we preserved their self-esteem. And you know what? They got it. They were reading. Within the year, they were reading Warriors, the Red Wall series. 
and oh, I hope I have that picture in here. Oh, I didn't put it in. Darn. I, I, I have a picture of the three inch book this child is reading now at 18. <laughs> so you don't know who's a late reader or who's an early reader based on when they read. And we live in a very, um, very saturated um, with words culture that every child learns to read. There are very, very few illiterate people out there. And if they are illiterate, it's because there's something in their brain that's not quite working right to decipher. It's a learning disability, but most children learn to read. Again, science and social are really good to teach experientially through experiments. And again, science is all around us. And social studies, uh, this is my son. We visited Dachau concentration camp in Munich. That brings it home to them. It's so much better to actually experience um, social studies and culture and history than actually reading about it in book. Much more. That learning sticks. Alberta Education says that children should not start online until grade five or age 10 because they don't have the stamina to sit there and concentrate. However, they kind of went against that ruling because of COVID because they have to fund teachers to teach. It's an essential industry and a billion dollar a year one. Where can you get hands-on materials? These are great stores all across Alberta. Scholar's Choice, Kids Source, they all have online um, portals too that you can go check them out. And don't forget those workbooks of chapters. Okay, I'm not going to go through this. These are different ways of teaching math. Um, find a support group. There are days where you're pulling your hair out, the kids are fighting, the house is a mess. But you're going to have those days if they went to school too. But you need a support group. <laughs> What about socialization? Children are exposed to more diversity in the community than single-aged children in an institutional classroom. Absolutely. They get to meet people of all ages, genders, abilities, cultures, religion, race, everybody. They are pretty good at talking to adults and pretty confident at talking to people from all stages of life. And most children need one good friend for a healthy upbringing, just one. And that good friend can be a sibling too. And if you're shielding your children from bullying, that's not a bad thing. If you equate it to the tree that grows up sheltered and protected from the winds, it grows strong and straight and now can withstand the winds of adulthood. But a tree that is not protected from bullying doesn't grow up straight and happy. So you can do that. Who's your facilitator? So when you sign up with a school authority. Now, if you decide not to go signing up with a school authority, if Bill 15 happens, you forego the funding. You say, no, nah, I don't want any facilitator. You forego all the help and support your facilitator can provide. And that to me is very valuable when you're first starting out. Um, they are your partner in education. They're a certified teacher. Chances are they're a homeschooling parent. They know that boys hate writing. <laughs> they know that girls love reading. <laughs> you know, and, and those are just stereotypes. But um, they're there to help you. They will help you pick curriculum based on your philosophy, on, you can phone them up any day and say, help, I don't know what to do about this. And they are your support all the way. We're just here to help you understand the whole picture, but they are your day-to-day -day support for the next year. So they'll come out and visit you in the fall and help you fine tune that learning plan. And like I said, you can scrap that learning plan and start a new one, it's very flexible. It's a work in progress. And then they come out in the spring and they ask, have a nice little tea and visit with your child and say, hey, what did you do? And you can show them all your videos. Videos is a good way. Videos and photos are a good way to document what your children learn because you're going to take pictures anyways and um, keep them. Certificates. So they go do a workshop at Lowe's, you know, keep the certificate. They write a letter to sample and Santa, keep that as a writing sample. And it's just a nice, fun social visit. No marks are given. 
and you get a report and um, that becomes a legal document that shows your child is learning. On distance education, you do not have visits because it's not home education. Um, your children will write exams. Um, they're encouraged to write provincial achievement tests and the school will give them marks. There's no marks on home ed. This is kind of a way I kind of kept track of what my kids were doing. Um, I just once a month would sit down and say, oh yeah, we went to the West Jet field trip or, you know, grade six. Oh, we went to the science center. I'm going to put that under grade six science or um, there's our West Jet field trip. <laughs> um, we stayed out and watched the Mercedes meteor shower. I'm going to put that under sky science, that kind of stuff, right? So it just helps me figure out, okay, what do I have to report to my facilitator in the spring? Because my child sits there and says, I don't know what we've done. And I sit there and think, I don't remember what we've done. So I need something to write. High school is a bit different. I actually, for each course, because high school is very, um, it's what counts <laughs> in Alberta education. Um, so each course, I would do a separate portfolio dual tang here. I'd put in a course proposal. Um, I put all the work the child did in the course, and then I put a course summary and a reflection, and then we submit that to our school authority um, with our proposed mark, and they say, yep, yep, this looks like they got the outcomes and the, the mark is substantiated, okay? So this is what your year-end report looks like. It's a one page. Um, it tells how you assessed, how you assess, not how the supervisor assessed and some comments, what your child did. So you are telling these comments to your supervisor who writes them down, gives you back the report, and puts one in your file, your child's file, and maybe sends one to the government. I don't know if they do that or not. So, and then you plan for the next year. Um, there's many ways to get organized. I had these bins for my kids for just admin work, um, and then all their projects and actual work was on bookshelves and, and places all over. You can never have enough bookshelves. <laughs> Even in university, their student loan applications, everything went in the admin file. And then all their real work and resources, you just um, can organize. It's nice to have many surfaces for them to do projects, to build, to work, to do artwork, and have a washable floor. Okay. And many children don't remember much before age 12. All the years we went to a homeschool center and we did experiments and we did classes and we had speakers come. My children don't remember any of those. The only thing they remember is the Pokemon candy machine in the lobby of that place. They don't even remember their friends from then. <laughs> but usually, um, but it, it builds brain cells, absolutely it does. You know, it stimulates those neurons, but I could have stayed home and they could have played video games for the same stimulation, really. <laughs> but it was good, we all got out and had fun. But usually about age 12, that's when they remember, that's when the real learning and remembering starts. If you have a child who has special needs, um, there's no extra funding for a child on home education. To get supports, you would have to be coded privately. Um, I would, there's no point doing it. I wouldn't recommend doing it right now because you do need to do it within three years of them going off to university or college. They want that current and it's costly. Um, to get support, you have to go directly to Alberta Health Services rather than through Alberta Education. Okay, and it's like stepping off a cliff. It's pretty scary that first year, but um, you do it year by year. You, you say, we're only signing up for this year. Let's try it out, see how it goes. And guaranteed by March, April, you'll be a pro at this. Absolutely. You'll have lots of peer and board support. And you absolutely can't stop your kids from learning. No child stopped learning the minute the schools were closed on March 15th. No child stopped learning. Did they stop learning what the government wanted them to learn? Yes but they kept on learning what they wanted to learn and it's all good. And we all homeschool till age six. Okay, and there's lots of benefits to home education. Kids get confidence and self-esteem. 
That's my daughter. She emceed the CBE Christmas pageant one year, and then she gave a speech at her graduation. Absolute confidence. Teenagers get to sleep in till like noon. <laughs> it's very relaxed for the whole family. We get all our outings done during the day and then night times and weekends are for families. There's time for interest. The kids are close. Yes, they still fight, but they grow up close. My kids are still each other's best friends, even though they live in separate countries and provinces, and they still get together most nights on Discord gaming, of course. Um, the family is a focus, not peers. They learn great work habits as they get into the teen years. They love learning. They have great social skills, and it's a one-on-one -on -one education. You absolutely can't beat that. But I still think this is the best, close family and siblings. Okay, so at this point, um, I would like to open it up for questions. Um, feel free to at this point with COVID, we have no idea how boards are going to offer social op opportunities in the fall or how that's going to work. We don't even know if the pools are going to open. Generally, home educators, they, they go to rec centers during the day, they go to pools, they go to parks, they go to the science center, they go to the zoo. We don't know what that's going to look like at this point. So um, it's kind of wait and see. How do only children do with homeschooling? Only children do absolutely uh, fantastic, but a lot of parents, again, provide those social opportunities. Um, and they get out, like some, there's lots of different styles. Some homeschoolers love to stay home. Um, I found my kids would fight if I stayed home. So a lot of homeschoolers like to go out, like me, and, um, Again, it's pretty hard to do that right now, to go out. So we'll wait and see. What is it considered when you send your child to a specific school for homeschoolers for a couple days a week? I am brand new to this, but I have friends who follow this method. Um, so again, this is outsourcing. So you are taking control of your child's education on home education. And if you want to send them to a outdoor forest school or you want to send them to a unschooling school or an online school you can do that you can bypass the whole Alberta government school system by still being in it you can still register as a home educator get funding and then outsource what you want specifically for your child send them to coding school or you know um, they can go to a maker space and do things there Lots of fun. Okay, how do home educated kids do? They do very well. They, um, they, the ones that write diploma exams, that is, we can treasure what we measure. So they do very well. Um, one of the, I was just looking at diploma exam results today, and it's really hard to separate the code 600 from the online kids or the school taught kids at home. So I was looking at just home educated kids writing the diploma exams and um, they, their average is about 74% compared to 65% for the provincial average. So those kids do fine and they don't even use Alberta homeschooling resources or textbooks. They can use travel or however they want to learn chemistry or math, they can use it. Um, how do you avoid boredom and disinterest? And um, they end up playing on technology all day. So I get that question all the time. Um, again, when kids are at home and they have lots of free time, yeah, they may be bored for a little bit, but they're also transitioning from being spoon fed to being in charge of their time and their learning and it takes a little adjustment but they eventually learn so you get to the point where your kids don't need direction during the day they will find something to do whether they're still in their pajamas playing with lego and you're having a cup of tea and reading your emails or um, they're on the ipad now according to technology there are 
families all over the map for that. There are families that have strict limits and there are families that have no limits. Um, I was one of the no limiters because <laughs> I unschooled. Um, yes, there were times that I was really worried about the amount of screen time my kids were getting, but um, the research shows that as long as children have physical activity, they have non-tech times, and um, I actually have a, a technology contract on my website, um, which is a non-punitive tech use contract between parents and children on um, how to manage screen time and what are your family rules, right? So it's okay to have rules and limits as long as it meets everybody's needs. And yes, there are times they're going to be bored and whine, and then you just give them some chores to do. <laughs> They'll find something to do. <laughs> but generally speaking, we do not entertain our home ed kids. They find things to do. It's really amazing. And I noticed a difference when I was a brownie or a girl guide leader. Um, the home ed girl guides, they'd be off and running and doing things and making up their own games and and yet the, the school girl guides were sitting there saying, okay, what do we do next? What are you going to do with us? <laughs> so it's a really big difference. Okay, another question. Um, you can find out where your children are at academically through placement tests. And your facilitator is the best person to help you with that because they, they have knowledge of those things. Um, I don't really know anything about that because I, like I said, we were unschoolers. We didn't do curriculum, so I didn't have to place my kids anywhere. But um, my child who had a learning disability, he did very well with unschooling because he learned what he wanted to learn. He learned in his own manner. It was very relaxed. It was non-pressured. He didn't have to churn out output. And, um, and then when he got to high school he had didn't have a whole lot of learning supports but boy did he have the supports when he got to university so um, home education is just naturally adaptable to kids with learning disabilities they're not forced to be in a classroom with artificial lighting they can take breaks they can go at their own pace they can um, listen to music they can move while they learn it's a lot more adaptable in your house than it is in a school and that's probably why it's not funded. Okay. Um, so question, if we only plan on homeschooling for one or two years, is it better to stick to the Alberta programs of study to make it easier to transition back into the school system? No. Um, <laughs> you, what you'll find is your child will be ahead um, when they go back into the system. So, for example, my daughter really, really wanted to go into grade three. She was eight years old. She had been homeschooled. She wanted to go. And April of grade three, I begged the school to take her and let her taste school for a few months. She was way ahead of them. She was reading Harry Potter and they were reading um, Ronald Dahl, I think. But she was way ahead. So the thing too is the topics in elementary grades are not building on one another so if your child misses science grade four and five they'll get it again in high school they really will because a lot of high school repeats the elementary years because they know kids don't remember these things they have to so if you take two years out to go travel the world and you give your kids no education whatsoever, they could very easily slot into two year grades above. Yes, math might be a little problem. There might be some topics they're not familiar with, but they can pick them up really fast. And keep in mind, unschooled children, they don't go to school at all until grade 10. Then they learn to write an essay. Then they learn how to do math on paper, and they do fine because their brain's ready. They can do all that catch up in very little time. And I'm actually gonna reinforce that. Most parents don't know this when their kids are in school, but what you say goes. If you 
if the school recommends your child should go into a um, high school dash two stream, you can override that because you are the parent. If you know your child best, if you know they can be successful at a different math stream or different social studies stream, you have that right to insist your child is registered in those courses. What grade they're in, that kind of thing. Um, and most parents don't know that because the school's not going to tell you that. But you do. You have absolute right because you're, you're your child's first teacher. Okay, question. With solo, do all of the 22 outcomes need to be met within the school year? Or is it okay to pick and choose? Absolutely, you can pick and choose. And some outcomes you're not going to do. Um, those outcomes need to be met by the time your child is 20. So September 1st, 20, hopefully you'll check off all those 22 outcomes and I guarantee you will be able to. Your child can play Minecraft all day and check off all those 22 outcomes, absolutely. Um, so for example, a few years, we just didn't do math. We did no more formal math program. We didn't do a textbook or a workbook. And I just wrote under the math sections, not going to do this year. We're going to play board games. So yeah. Um, why does Alberta Program of Studies have so many per year then? Um, it's because the Alberta Programs of Study is made by people who have jobs in education. And they need to keep kids busy for six hours a day, 200 days a year, while their parents a lot of parents work. So a lot of those kids have to go to school because of employment support. Um, and so when you have all those kids in school, you have to keep them busy. You have to feed them something. So, but you don't have to at home at all. You can do whatever you want to do at home. Okay. The other thing too is why there's 1400 Alberta programs of study outcomes per grade too is because the social studies curriculum developers do not talk to the English curriculum developers. So each of them decides, hey, problem solving, teamwork, those are good skills to have. Let's put those in as an outcome. And they do it in each subject. So you have problem solving in English, in science, in math, in social studies, in phys ed. And once your child learns to problem solve, you can check it off in all those subjects, right? So a lot of them, overlap absolutely so um they don't talk to each other <laughs> okay do we have a webinar now how to do the solo as a guide for teaching no but that's an interesting one yeah we should especially this summer a lot of the school authorities are going to be open for much of july and august um, they may be closed maybe a few weeks maybe mid-july mid-august but definitely mid-August, they're going to be open again and experience probably a wave of homeschooling questions. August 1st is when the minister decides what schooling is going to look like. So um, you might want to have your decision made before August 1st and the tsunami comes. <laughs> so, but they are mostly open on those bookends of summer. So don't, don't worry. But again, expect September is going to be crazy busy if, you know, you call your school and they don't get back to you right away. They, they have you on the radar. You, you can still start curriculum with your kids if you want. But even if you don't get started to October, don't worry. They will still keep learning. You'll get it all done. No problem. Okay. Hey, I'm going to say good night and thank you so much for coming, having tea with me, and I wish you all the best in your homeschooling journey. You're going to have so much fun. You're going to love your kids. They're going to learn so much, and you can do this. You are a pro. You've been doing it since they were born. You got this, okay? So, great. <laughs> nice meeting you. Thanks, and we'll chat again soon.